I was very inspired this morning um, by the by the two panels, and just want to thank them and especially the students for a lot of takeaways that you know I, I went back and I was saying to this table over here afterwards. Well, if um, you are a an employee at UPS, is UPS I know has a tuition assistance program. Where is the business community in this conversation? And did the students, if they are working, and it sounds like at least those two students are going to continue working, and it's probably representative of working students going forward, you know, where, where is the employer community in terms of benefits that could accrue to the working student? Another takeaway was, well, you know, the research so far that I've read says, about 20 hours a week, plus or minus, for a full-time student maximizes your ability to do well in school. I think some of the research says 15, some says 20, and, you know, work studies built on 20, so there's a whole lot of historical research on this. Um, and these students, too many of them, I, I know in community colleges where I came from, more than half um, are working full-time of the more than two-thirds that are working. So, you know, these students are working 20, 30, 40, and even more hours to make ends meet. So I think, you know, if, if there's anything uh, that I can say to the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, partner with the other Federal Reserves and help us figure this out so promises can be delivered for the working student, many of whom are parents. And the other thing that is not in my slides um, is, and I should have a slide on this, is um, the fact that 25% or plus or minus um, of undergraduates are parent students, student parents. And in community colleges, which have about half of the students in the country who are undergraduates, uh, it's about more than 40%, I think. So that's another big sort of takeaway in terms of first generation working students, students that are parents, and subgroups of what we think of when we just think of the whole swath of undergraduates. So I run the College Promise Campaign. We've been at this now. This will start our fifth year in the fall. And I um, want to thank University of Pennsylvania and many other, you know, MDRC and the Upjohn Institute. You'll hear from Michelle Miller Adams in a little while, uh, and certainly West Ed out in California, and other think tanks and universities that have come in to really work on this problem of, you know, how can we increase college affordability, make it possible for students to go on the financing side and on the attainment side, help more students, especially those who are underserved in American higher education, get through college while they work, while they raise a family, and to do good things for our prosperity, whether it's economic, social, or civic. And I usually use those three parts of the equation because much of the conversation is on economic impact. And I also um, want, you know, think it's very important to talk about the social and civic impacts of a more educated community. And I also, you know, we've spent in the last four years almost a lot of time focused on the local level because that's where the majority of innovations and system changes can be then spiraled upward, whether it's regional or statewide. And I think we forget about it. Certainly after an election, governors come in with their new teams. They put promises in place. We have a lot of variation around the country in what states are doing. Uh, and, I, and I have a slide on this, which I'm not going to uh, step on, you know, uh, dwell on. But today, 24 states have done some version of a promise, and it's representative of what we're seeing at the local level. That variation you'll see in states as well as local, local communities. And so can't we, with this huge menu of promise programs around the country, figure out what those best designs are that are producing the outcomes we want, which are affordability, attainment, workforce success, and also not a lot of conversation at all in the research about quality. We have a lot of conversation about student choice, and we have better outcomes and worse outcomes in these promise programs. But how do we map all this back to 
how do, college, how do students choose and students' family understand whether if you're in a region that has no choice or lots of choices, what those choices could really be in terms of quality? Uh, and it's not just accreditation, but it really is the things I think Phoebe was talking about in our kickoff uh, landscape this morning. You know, the kinds of supports that are internal to K-12 schools and higher education, as well as the wraparound from community uh, organizations like the nonprofits, like the business leadership and others. So my slides, I go through pretty fast. Um, I'll, I'll start off by telling you, you know, free equals paid for. So when you have, you know, free is a buzzword <laughs> that really turns off people that got it with by doing it themselves. And I think that was referenced this morning. But College Promise is often referred to as the free college movement. And I sort of stand up and wave my hands and, and show them, you know, the slide of 24 states, half red, half blue, more than 300 local communities, half red, half blue. And I say, you know, it is being paid for in some way. But the messaging for students, especially students who don't think it's possible, whose parents maybe didn't get those chances, it will draw them into the enrollment statistics you saw in the data this morning. Uh, but it's not a new problem. A uh, hundred years ago, we had it. Here's a smattering of, of colleges and universities starting in the 1800s. I think you can go back to say, you know, when did we make high school free and how long did that take? Um, anybody know the first high school that was free in the country and what century that was in? Come on, historians. Okay, Boston Latin School, the 1600s. Um, my, my dad, who was first generation, the only one actually who, who went beyond high school, went there. So I'm just doing a tribute to Boston Latin School. But that was the 17th century. Anybody know the date when the last state legislature put in for high school for all? No? Okay the late 1920s, 1929. So, you know, it took a long time to do this, and we are in the 21st century. We galvanized around the GI Bill. So we had a mindset at the time in the four, late 40s and, and 50s that we could educate a more diverse set of people, especially those who had served. So when I look at promises today that have a service requirement, and I think Phoebe was talking about that this morning, you know, the high impact practices are to engage students. A lot of times you'll hear words like civic learning or impact um, practices. You know, we paid for what we valued. So we valued that people took a risk like my dad did, went across, you know, to France and Germany and took a risk and many lost their lives and came back so they got a benefit, which was the GI Bill, to pay for four years of an undergraduate education, or you could use it for advanced education. And they extended the GI Bill a couple years ago, so maybe it was last year even. Uh, was it 2017? So we, we do this for subgroups of Americans. Now we have lots of different subgroups can we do more of this? So I'm going to make that point. Um, on the slide, you also saw Rice Institute. That did not go paid for until not the 1960s. So we had public and private. I just use that as an example. Um, so why is it so popular now? Here's a little my take. I've got like just a couple slides. I'm not going to go through each of these numbers, but you know, we're going to need more educated people, let me just say that. And you can look up here and see how many jobs and, and homeless and hungry. And thank you, Eddie Conroy, for being here. Um, you know, with the research that's going on at Temple on homeless and hungry. Um, we've lost our share in terms of economic competitiveness worldwide. Um, we've got 10 countries in the world that have college for all, have free college. So there's a lot of global interest in this. In fact, I was at a graduation, a community college graduation last weekend, and um, the president said there's a whole delegation from Ethiopia coming because they want to understand what the promise is. So there's just a huge amount of momentum in this realm. And for us, I think you saw this morning, it's all about design. And I think, you know, this slide says a lot about inequities and inequalities. Um, and if you look at the 
you know, graph on the right hand side, you know, family income is such a strong determinant of who gets to go and why. And I think the compelling stories of the students were, were really phenomenal. Um, you can have all these slides, by the way. So, you know, I'm happy to share these, but these are just data points from different studies that really underscore who's going and what the challenges are. Um, for racial gaps, you know, I really want to um, show this chart of the Lumina Foundation put together. Maybe it was Ed Trust and, you know, it impacted the, the Lumina Foundation to do this. But while all groups are making progress in the country, and while we have, you know, more students graduating from high school than we've ever seen, even though we have declining enrollments, we have more high school graduates all to the good, what we don't have is enough closing of these gaps. So you see all of the groups increasing, but we don't have enough uh, emphasis on the equity considerations on how to close those gaps. That again, you know, every panelist talked about solutions for that. And that's where I think the Promise programs can offer um, a new menu for rethinking good design. I call it smart design. Um, so we've got our challenges with degree completion. We've got our challenges with affordability. I think if anything that the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia could do is really put a stake in the ground for understanding the equity gaps and really looking at different subgroups and what those students need because students from first generation families are going to need more because they don't have the family guidance. They may have really poor college guidance or really great college guidance if they have you know, lower ratios and so on in the schools that they go to. But it's a real uh, challenge to, to tackle this equity question and I hope all of us are gonna do our part in this. Um, so what's the vision of this? You know, let, let's everybody get through some college, the most college they can. At this point, doing this for now almost, you know, for the last four years, um, I think we need to have a mindset that education beyond high school should be a continuous opportunity going forward. Because I don't think, as I look at, you know, driverless trucks, and I had a CEO from a company say, Right after a, t a talk I did at, at the Scholarship America banquet a couple weeks ago, there were a couple of hundred people, and he came up and he said, Martha, I need 50 truck drivers. And I said, how much do you pay? He said, above minimum wage, 15 to 20 an hour. I said, okay, do they have to live near you? No, they can live anywhere in the country. So um, I found a, a truck driving school in a community college. Every six weeks, they graduate these students. They can go into that. But what happens in five to 10 years when we have automated truck driving? Um, what happens when artificial intelligence takes over a lot of these manually, manual labor requirements on different <laughs> sectors of the job? Um, you know, FedEx is a really good example about how much more will that be automated or Amazon coming in? So I think we've got to have this continuous focus that everyone should at least get some college, if not more and more and more. Um, what's a promise? You know, to me, when I say to this to people, a promise is something you keep. Otherwise, it's not a promise. So I look for in local communities and states and institutions evidence that there is a promise. Is there a written commitment? Is there an MOU? Is there a list of how the different promise leaders are contributing to this promise being made to these students at this point in time? And is there documentation for this? Um, what are they committing to? Are they committing to at least going beyond high school, at least one, two, four years, if not more? Um, and then how are they gonna pay for it? Um, I think the panel this morning talked about the different features. I think the research is very exciting to unpack each of these features. Um, I added a couple that I want to see. You know, they should be evidence and performance based, which is why when the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, puts a stake in the ground to even look at this, um, I think you're saying that you're going to have some quality research behind this to look at not only maybe the economic impacts of this, but other ancillary impacts that are, you know, critically important. Um, sustainable leadership, you know, the question this morning about politics. Um, 
that's where if we're going to change administrations, whether it's a local community, whether I, I worked in community colleges for many years, it's an aging out presidency. It's an aging out faculty in K-12 and higher education. That's why we have so many jobs open in education. It's the salaries, but it's also the aging out. Um, are we going to have leaders that will come in and carry the ball forward? And is there an infrastructure to support that? So I think the bottom couple are really, um, you know, ripe for more investigation. I think you covered this this morning, so I'm not going to really focus on first dollar, last dollar. We call it last dollar plus, which is sort of in the, you're doing more than last dollar, like you're putting in an emergency grant or like you're putting in $500 a semester beyond the last dollar that covers non-college costs like books. But um, I think that's really important. I also, you know, this slide is, and this is another area that I think is so exciting, um, every promise is going to have a menu of multiple funding sources. I, I think there's hardly any that rely on, that, that don't rely on a FAFSA. Maybe below, I'm looking at Laura Perna, maybe below a few percent. But yeah. most of them, uh, Dallas is a great example, you know, 53 high schools. They have a competition going among their high schools to fill out the FAFSA. They added in an adult promise version, but everyone is bringing this FAFSA forward. But the other parts are, you know, what is philanthropy doing? What can local government do at the county level on, in Maryland? The county executives actually led the path to put in promises in seven different counties in Maryland. And then that bubbled up to the state promise that they have now in, in, in Maryland. Um, and business investments that I talked about. Um, I put together this list of the sources, so you can go back to them. There are even going to be more. Um, I just saw an announcement, I think this morning, that uh, one institution is going to give free college to any Native American student that enrolls uh, from any tribe across the country. There are 560 tribes, as an example. But this is a long list of different ways that funding can be knitted together which is probably why when you hear from um, uh, uh, some, uh, the Pittsburgh Promise folks on the panel this afternoon, um, it's crazy making for Promise directors because you're trying to knit together all these funding streams and it's probably crazy making for the presidents as well because we don't simplify this network of financing. Just like we don't simplify the eligibility criteria, we don't simplify the messaging. It gets too complicated because we have too many subgroups um, to deal with. Um, this, these are just examples of mayors and governors leading the way, business leaders leading the way, foundations leading the way um, to fund the promise or to do startup funding with a goal that it should be financially sustainable. Um, so, you know, people lose interest in this. I think it was said at our, at our table uh, this afternoon, you know, how long are funders going to keep investing in this for what outcomes, for what performance requirements? And I think we need to ask ourselves that. Um, here are my slides that just show you the promise growth. So I'm going to go really quickly. Um, the national landscape, these are all the governors and states that have put in some kind of version of a promise. Um, persistence and completion impacts, we really covered that this morning. Um, and the equity impacts, which we'll talk more about, but you heard about some of those this morning. And also some challenges, you know, one of the comments was uh, from, uh, you know, on the, on the, uh, one of the presentations this morning, are we, um, are we studying the additional cohorts to see as those programs change, and better solutions hopefully get put in place, will there be better outcomes? And that's why these investments are so important because we've got a changing landscape as well as you know, a very big bucket to fill. Um, and here are some of the outcomes on equity that we're starting to track. So we really wanna look at programs by groups, ethnic, racial, income, um, other features of these different groups, parents is one I mentioned. But you know, the more we can distill the different needs of these different populations, the better I think the colleges and universities can target their resources to really serve the full gamut of who's coming because no community is the same. 
Um, I have a couple slides on why, you know, the ROI. So this is one from the College Board. They do this every year. Um, you heard the working students that did such great uh, presentations this morning. Um, the working students are going to pay more in taxes. Lucky you, if you become a lawyer or a stockbroker, you are going to be paying more taxes because you got a better education and you finished your education and you went on to grad school and you got your MBA and you went back to UPS and you got their, their tuition assistance to help you through grad school. Um, and you're going to make more money over your lifetime with more education. I don't think that's disputed at all. Um, what isn't talked about as much is the lessening of reliance on government resources or the lessening of people that live healthier lives or don't end up in jail. Those are huge cost savings. I can tell you, you know, when I served as a chancellor of the community colleges in California, it was fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to warehouse a student who smoked pot three times, um, you know, with the three strikes law. And over thirty years, I watched prisons being built, and I shook my head and and said, much less the salaries when I compared, um, you know, prison guards to the teachers that I was responsible for. We have a whole separate system that we've invested in. And we pay for what we value. So from my perspective, we should invest in this. It's much more positive, and the outcomes will be better. Um, people will get more jobs. People will be happier. There's happiness research now to follow, health research, um, prison research. And um, what we do in the campaign, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but our goal is to really build broad public support for financially sustainable, stable promise programs that are going to get more students through college, through the workforce, in multiple jobs over time. And we have just been working at this for many years, um, and we will continue to do this. Uh, we have different leaders on the board from business, government, philanthropy. We're really focused on, we've got a bibliography of over 100 studies that have already been done. A number of the researchers here are in the bibliography, and you'll hear from some of the experts up here in a minute. Um, and what we want to do, which is most important, is scale what's working. Um, and what's working in two domains, students and families on the one hand, and policymakers and researchers on the other. So if we can really look at, you know, the more than 300 promise programs, we're vetting another couple hundred now. We've got 24 states. There are many states now. There's 10 more that have legislation pending. Um, this is growing. Somebody asked about the politics. Well, when um, these big firms that have communications you know, spend a lot of money on, on, on uh, surveys, survey college promise or free college, they have over an 80% response rate from the public that it's very popular, that is a very good thing to put your stake in the ground on. So people can now run around the country and figure out what's working and what meets their criteria, whether it's going from universal to highly targeted, because you'll see this huge range depending on what states and communities feel it's best to invest in. But that's why we're seeing so much momentum. Um, we have a few years of outcomes. I'm not going to run through these, but you can see these on the slides. Um, tremendous growth, tremendous awareness, showcasing what works in the research. Um, we have a research network we're really excited about, so if you want to be part of that, just send me an email, martha at collegepromise.org, and we'll put you into that. We want young scholars as well as really established folks that are here. So, you know, if you're in, in a doctoral program or a master's program, let us know and we'll put you into the research network uh, because we're really excited to grow the literature base for Promise. We have to find out what works. Um, we will have a financial sustainability report coming out on the first 200 Promise programs this fall. We're going to have a vetting next week on it this summer. We've got a bunch of case studies, so you may not have heard. You heard a lot about Kalamazoo this morning, but one of the programs that, was, that happened around Kalamazoo in addition to Pittsburgh, which started a couple years later, was El Dorado, Arkansas. And um, in El Dorado, what was very interesting, the El Dorado Promise, 
if you graduated from high school, again, not an adult promise program, but if you graduated from high school, you would go any, you could go anywhere in the country to get a four-year undergraduate education, and that is fully paid for, and it's sustainable. Again, it was a private sector, you know, high wealth set of donors that invested. That's unlikely in the rest of this country, but I think what's instructive are the models, are the ideas of these designs, and they actually track that more than 70% of those graduates came back to Arkansas. So they didn't put a condition on it. We talked about simplifying the conditions um, of it'll turn into a loan if you don't come back. They could cover the costs for the investment. It was a sustainable plan. Um, I sort of take away on these three slides, you know, can we rev leverage the policy um, quantitative and qualitative research that's going on to actually improve what happens at the local and state level in terms of policies? Um, I think many of us in the room have been beneficiaries of bad policy. I have been trying to get rid of the FAFSA for 10 years now, um, since 2009. It's 2019. We do not need this form. Um, I have a solution for all the special populations whose income changes, but it is an unnecessary burden on students and families. And I hope something happens. Um, and that's, you know, it can be done. It can be done. Um, we need to really help people understand the value in the ROI. And then, you know, on this last one, um, increasing quality for us is where are the best pro promise programs in the country? How are they designed? Who owns them? Is it a promise that we can count on for the population or populations that are eligible to participate? Um, and it's interesting, you know, we have places like Hawaii or San Francisco in the West, Universal, Van Guarantee uh, in North Carolina, different promise programs that are universal that include everyone, but are they going to be sustainable over time? And that's the challenge. Um, these are just a couple of slides I, I put together uh, that you can take away if you want to make the case for why, why people are interested in this. So we talked about education and work this morning, how important that interface is. We have to think of ourselves as having a working student population now with different needs um, than people had 30, 40 years ago when some got free college if they had to get that. Um, shortening time to degree, students are wasting more than, on average, 20% more classes than they really need to get to that next level. I'm all for exploration, but I'm not for wasting time and credits and money. Um, and then I do think, as I said at, at the beginning, you know, the employer community really needs to be central to this. And I was thrilled to hear about year-round Pell, and I keep saying, how can we get part-time working students to go full-time? Can they really take five classes a semester or four classes and four classes and six in the summer? Um, and can they be as full-time as we can get them because the research says those students will be more successful than non-full-time students, and that's a big challenge for us. Um, so for the financial sustainability, we want to lower college costs, obviously. We want something that's sustainable. We want to, as I said, to knit these funding streams together. So we're looking at federal funds, state funds, and talked about this morning, you know, the work-study formula is out of date. It's 50 years old. Um, we need some changes there. Uh, but can we integrate those streams to work collectively in a way that students don't have to figure out all the differences? I think there could be an app to do this or some way to simplify it for students. And then I think we have a lot of inefficiencies in the system. Um, a lot of barriers. I think Georgia State, we, we mapped this in a, in a paper called Promise with a Purpose. They've identified 800 barriers to student success. Um, and they are tackling them very methodically, one by one, to eliminate the different barriers. So if you think there's only a few that we've talked about today, there's hundreds more that we need to get rid of. Um, I have a whole list of things for education and finance leaders um, that is really pretty redundant with what I've just said. 
But I think also in order to study Promise programs, we've got to have data sharing agreements and an integration of work data, social service data, education data, and community data. Um, one thing high school principals told me over those many years was, I don't have anybody at my high school who can manage all the nonprofit after school programs that are helping students. And I am all for boys and girls clubs. I love boys and girls clubs and all the service clubs. But, you know, that's a way that communities can really step up and try to simplify so that students who need more support can really get that. Um, so with that, how do we design for impact and improvement? These are just suggestions on access, FAFSA completion, wraparound, advising, counseling. Um, I'll tell you a quick story and then we'll take some questions and then we will get the panel up here at 1.30. Um, but I was in um, a very cold climate in southwestern Kansas at 5 in the morning waiting for a plane that was going to take off at 6 in the morning. And um, I didn't really know it. It was snowing and I had a big coat on. Um, and there was one other guy across the way, also there it was dark. He was in a wraparound black coat. I was in my coat. Um, and I didn't know that they only opened the airport 10 of 6 in this small little town. It was a little Piper plane. And it turned out it was General Wesley Clark. And he, he said to me, I said, well, what are you working on? And he said, half of veterans aren't using the GI Bill. We have a problem. And I said, well, what do you want every veteran to have? I want that veteran to have a counselor, an advisor, a coach, and you heard MDRC talk about the coaching, and counselor, advisor, coach, and mentor. I want four people on that veteran in some way. Maybe you can double up in two and two, but... I thought, perfect um, menu for Promise students. They may need a coach. They may not need an advisor because we've got good advising. College Advising Corps does really great advising, but it's only for seniors. You know, what about middle school kids? And so I think my, just in my um, comments, this really is redundant with what you heard this morning about the messaging and the leadership, um, but we need to really build and sustain this mo these models and one size will not fit all. So I think where we've lost our way in policy is to say this is the cookie cutter. I'm all for minimum standards. I think we ought to have minimum standards for quality, minimum standards for equity, minimum standards for attainment. But we have to really recognize that communities are at different stages, institutions are at different stages, and if people are moving toward becoming better and better in an improvement mindset, I think we'll all be for the better um, for it. So let me open it up for questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I'm happy. No question is stupid. I tell that to my, I have a couple of my former students here this afternoon. Um, so ask away. And, you know, if I can't answer it, I think somebody in the room probably can. Thank you, everyone. Yay. Stand up, tell us who you are, where you're from, why you're here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Ortiz. I work for a CBO in New York um, called Cape Highlands Tutorial Program. Um, this is more so uh, an inquiry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry to anybody who couldn't hear me. Um, I was really excited about this idea of doing away with FAFSA. Um, I think if anyone's directly worked with students, you know that especially the verification process is a huge barrier for students. Um, and while in New York we have great programs like TAP and Excelsior, they do all the things that the researchers have shared that they shouldn't do, like put academic criteria on students being able to keep that aid. Um, so. I'm just genuinely excited and interested in, in hearing about your ideas around FAFSA and um, ways that we can contribute to that energy. Yeah, I mean, the first thing, I would just go local 
and talk to your members of Congress and your senators if you can get in the door there or their staffs. You know, staff are, are fantastic and they do a huge amount of work simplifying the messaging that goes up the chain to their, you know, elected official, whether it's a local mayor, a county executive or a county supervisor or, a lo you know, an elected state um, official or even federal officials. But, you know, we've really been concentrating on local and state. So I think, you know, even just coming in and explaining, okay, we did cut out 50. I mean, I have to say, I have to give credit to the Obama administration where due. And we did cut out 50 questions on the form, but there are way too many questions still. And, you know, working at this for 10 years, I think you can go and make the case very simply. And if there are student advocacy organizations here like Young Invincibles, you know, have this menu. Um, there was a proposal that went through to make it down to two questions. Um, I think that's that will be a whole lot better. Um, but it is hard, and I think it starts local. I think you have to just help people understand that in terms of criteria, this is one more thing for people to do that they get lost in. And there are so many other criteria that students get lost in um, that you know, if we can make this simpler, it would be a huge amount of help. I was surprised, you know, working on this for so many years, there's an industry around this. So, you know, I don't, I don't think we should be unsophisticated about the unintended consequences of eliminating an education industry that's making money on this, that's providing support. I always say, you know, there are more students that could be helped than we have time for. So these industries, I've been watching some of the loan programs actually do call center training to help students um, meet their financial obligations instead of collecting on loans anymore. So, I mean, there are lots of changes in these different industries, but I think it's really important to, you know, think about the unintended consequences of these industries if we really went forward with the FAFSA elimination. A lot of people get jobs by helping students fill out those forms. Um, and other other compensation that goes along with with that whole industry. So that would be my advice. Yes, back there, and then you over here. Where are you from, and who are you? Hello. Oh, hi. I'm uh, Jacob Brosh with the Reinvestment Fund. We're a CDFI based here in Philadelphia. Um, I'm curious if you could speak to. Um, as you're going around the country and talking with different communities or states or um, areas that are interested in in creating these programs. So what are some of the benefits that you talk to them about that they could imagine at sort of a community level? So not thinking about how these programs benefit individual students, but how they might benefit cities or communities. Or yeah, cities. I mean, I hear I really want to want to um, celebrate the work of the Upjohn Institute. And we're really fortunate that Michelle Miller Adams is going to come up on the panel because one of the goals that we're seeing in Promise programs are, you know, Will, will these programs, and you saw it on the chart, you saw, you know, you didn't see a lot of growth in housing stability. You know, will people stay because they can have a meaningful life in their local community? You know, we have a lot of migration in the country. We have a lot of young people moving to cities because they simply can't find work in their local communities. I was just in one, Sauk Valley, Illinois, um, that is restarting a whole new set of industries. But without that local leadership, you have what we call education deserts or deserts in the, in the, in the country. And I, if I were Bill Gates, I would put my foundation in the south. I would break it up actually into five foundations, but I would put one right in the south and it would not be in Atlanta. It would be in the deep south um, to really help those communities rebuild their economic trajectory. So I think that's that's one thing. It depends on where you go, what that community needs in terms of its workforce, its housing starts, is there building going on? You know, Kalamazoo can you know can look at you know many many years of of experience to actually chart that economic growth. Brad Hirschbein, who's not here, is one of Michelle Miller Adams' partners um, in this work, and they've got a whole series of studies that you know Michelle agreed to chair our workforce subgroup of the research committee. So hopefully, you know, with Fed and other groups that are looking at this, we can look at what are those local economic impacts that could actually spur development. Um, I will say that with the trade policy, 
um, revolutions going on every other day, it's very hard for communities to really map out what industries will stay. You know, will industries be stable? Are they going to be really addressing the changes that we're seeing in, you know, information technology and robotics and what I mentioned, the driverless car? But I think those are some of the things that we talk about to get communities just thinking in that way. Um, usually they're economic development committees um, and regional economic development. They can pull down some money from the state. They have a workforce investment board. That should be a partner in these college promise conversations so that they are actually at the table. And I will mention Strive Together, which actually brings in these different partners to a round table in these different communities that they work in. I think they've got 70 communities now that have these community-wide round tables. Um, Dallas is a great example of the Dallas County Promise that has an infrastructure, it has a commit partnership that Strive is helping to support, and they've really thought it through. They started, you know, with a BCG study to kind of look at the economic impact, and there's lots of pages of data. Um, but Dallas, you know, has more funding than, you know, a Sauk Valley in western, northwestern Illinois. I think we have time for one last question before we bring the panel up, but the panelists can start coming up if you'd like to. Hello, Natalie Grandison, A. James, and Alice B. Clark Foundation. We fund higher ed as well as um, DC education and DC community. Can you briefly talk about the choice to go through the community college and how College Promise works to help students with the difficulty in transitioning culturally to a four-year institution and how you work if you work with any four-year um, universities to help with uh, articulation agreements and making sure that the students don't end up having to take courses over again? Yeah, I mean, all of those things, I have to tell you, College Promise has eight people. We are a tiny, we are not a think tank. I'll do a list of what we're not. Uh, but we are focused on really building this, this momentum, this movement. So what we do is we will go to those roundtables. We will go to the thought leaders in that community, or we'll ask some of the think tanks that really do the technical assistance and support. I mean, NBRC's here. Um, they're working with six community colleges around their student success initiative. So in terms of the pathways, the guided pathways you talked about, there is a lot of adoption around the ASAP model that came out of SUNY, uh, CUNY, I'm sorry, CUNY. That's very exciting work to say, you know, we need to be more intentional, more targeted about what we're giving to students when they come in the front door. And I think you heard this morning, you know, at Rutgers Camden, what they're doing with the wraparound services and the support to make sure students are on the right pathway. So if you want to be a stockbroker, you know, you're going to be on a finance pathway. If you want to be a lawyer, you're going to be on this other pathway. But you are going to take all the necessary courses and reduce those extra um, time and effort and money that you're putting into taking things that might be great to do. I'm all for electives, as I said, but just a couple. Um, to stretch whether you're in the right major, whether this is really something that you can push put yourself into. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, thanks everybody. We're